So, welcome to today's uh, lecture on uh, multi-phase flows. What uh, we will do today is uh, discuss another uh, instability problem in multi-phase flows in uh, two-phase flows, okay. And uh, this particular uh, instability problem is called uh, viscous fingering and it also goes by the name of uh, Safman taylor problem after the two people who first uh, investigated this problem. So, what we will do is we will uh, discuss this problem today, the Safman taylor formulation and that is basically what we are going to stick to. We are going to make the assumptions which uh, Safman and Taylor did and then who analyzed the problem, okay. And uh, formulation of viscous fingering, that is the physical phenomena. Now, uh, this particular problem has a lot of uh, applications especially in the field of uh, oil recovery, okay. So, you are talking about enhanced oil recovery. So, you know as chemical engineers or as engineers who are interested in energy, we are having uh, certain upstream operations wherein you have uh, all these petroleum uh, reservoirs, crude reservoirs and one of the objectives is to take out all this oil which is present underneath in a porous media, okay. So, you want to be able to extract it so that then you can come and process it in your refinery and get your petrol, diesel, etcetera, okay. So, enhanced oil uh, recovery is an upstream operation and what is our objective? To recover the crude oil from the underground reserves, okay. So, basically what we are talking about is you have oil which is present in a porous bed, okay. And uh, so, what we want to do is we want to be able to pump it out. So, one way that is normally used is you actually pump in water at high pressure and the water will actually displace this oil and uh, what was originally containing petroleum will now contain water and all the petroleum which was present, the crude which was present will actually come to the surface. Okay. So, what we are trying to do is we are trying to displace one liquid using another liquid. So, we displace the crude oil present in the porous bed with water. Okay. So, what it means is a porous bed initially has oil and after uh, some time it is filled with water. Now, the problem that we are talking about, if you really want to visualize this, let us say 
this is my porous bed okay i'm just drawing it horizontal and uh, so i mean i don't want to confuse things but just imagine this is a porous bed so these are your soil particles is, is that everywhere i'm just not drawing too many of them and uh, you have oil here present what i'm going to do is i'm going to be pumping in water from the left okay of course, in actual situation, you do not have a well defined geometry, but since we are interested in the mathematical formulation for understanding, we are looking at a very nice geometry, rectangular geometry. Okay, and here let us see there is a water, and this is the interface between oil and water. Okay. Ideally, the question that we, what we are interested in asking is, when I were to do this pumping of water to displace oil, will this interface, for example, always remain flat? If it remains flat, then the entire oil which is present in the reservoir is going to be recovered, is going to be displaced because if every, the interface continues to remain flat, so, so for when you are doing the pumping, there are going to be disturbances. Disturbances can be because of some uh, non-homogeneity in the soil property, in the density of the soil packing, things like that, okay, in the porosity for example. The question is, is this interface going to remain flat as it moves? So the problem is, I am pumping in water. water continuously is the interface going to be flat. If it is flat, then we have all the oil recovered, all the oil will be displaced and you have 100% recovery, okay. If yes, then 100% oil recovery is done. But supposing the interface does not remain flat, what is likely to happen is you give a small disturbance and the interface starts growing like this. So, when you get this is after the disturbance has actually evolved in time. So, first you give a small disturbance which may be sinusoidal, but what is likely to happen is if the, this, if the system is not stable. If the system is stable, the small disturbance is going to disappear and you get back your flat surface. But supposing this is interface is actually unstable, then this interface is going to get deflected. Okay. And if it gets deflected, then clearly this, when you are pumping in water, this guy, which, uh, this is water here and this is oil here. The water is going to, is pro, uh, the tip of this finger, as you can see, this is all looking like uh, fingers, okay. And that is the reason we call it uh, fingering and it is actually got to do with the viscosity, okay. Uh, th this is going, moving at a faster rate and that means it is essentially unstable and this guy will actually penetrate the bed and come out as water, okay. And what that means is there will be pockets of oil which are going to be left trapped inside the reservoir which you have not recovered. So, basically it is a uh, you know incomplete recovery of all the crude oil, you understand. So, that is basically what the implication is. So, basically what this means is here the uh, velocity of the water tip is fast, it breaks through the bed 
okay, and the petrol crude is going to be uh, left behind partially. So, you do not have recovery of the entire uh, petrol crude. So, one of the things we want to do is we want to try and understand um, what is it that is actually causing this kind of a phenomena if this occurs. So actually, experimentally you can actually uh, do this. So, all you have to do for example, if you want to do a simple experiment, you can just take two glass slides, put uh, small uh, glass uh, spherical particles, okay. You can make your own porous bed and you can just pump, you can fill it with one liquid pump another liquid and see if the liquid is actually going to be displaced and if the interface is flat. A very simple experiment for you to do because clearly you cannot do an experiment underground, right. So, basically what we want to do is we want to do an experiment make a porous bed which is hopefully transparent so that you can see this interface. So, you can make put small glass beads, make this bed, fill it with oil of whatever properties you want and then pump another liquid and then see under what conditions is the interface going to remain flat, under what conditions is the interface going to actually deform and deflect. So, you can possibly uh, put a small dye to be able to contrast between the two liquids. If both of them are transparent, then you will not be able to see how the interface is. So, th things like that. So, uh, but this is the actual question that we are asking, okay. And uh, clearly, uh, two things are important. One is the viscosity and of course, the surface tension because you are talking about the, in the interface. So, what uh, Safman and Taylor did is they uh, studied the problem in the absence of surface tension, that is what we will do, but then you can always include the effect of surface tension and then you can uh, redo the analysis. Um, this problem is uh, similar in some sense to the Rayleigh-Taylor problem. If you remember the Rayleigh-Taylor problem, I mean, I think that is something which you people have to do. We have done all these different instabilities in the class. You should be able to see what the similarities are and the dissimilarities are. That helps you understand things better. In the Rayleigh Taylor problem, if you remember, you had two liquids, one on top of the other, and the two liquids were stationary, okay. And then you ask the question when, when is the uh, interface going to be stable, unstable, okay. So, in that particular case, we consider the situation of inviscid liquids. Here, I want to include the effect of viscosity because it turns out that that is an extremely crucial parameter. It turns out that the viscosity ratio between these two fluids is the one which actually decides whether the interface is flat or not flat, okay. And what we try to do is prove this mathematically. Um, over there, we included the effect of surface tension, but we let go of uh, viscosity. Here we are doing the opposite. We are going to keep viscosity, but right now to begin with we are going to let go of surface tension. So, and then we can see and the only thing is that it was a vertical thing. Here also we can put vertical. In fact, we will have a vertical uh, geometry here also. And uh, of course, that the base velocity was 0 and we did the linearization. Here the base velocity is not going to be 0 because you are actually having a continuous pumping of one liquid over the other. So, having said that, what we want to do is rather than analyze this problem with a base velocity which is a uniform velocity, we will do the analysis of the problem in a moving reference frame, okay. So, basically what I am saying is the base velocity whose stability I am interested in measuring, let me come here, this is a question we are asking. The base velocity is uniform across the cross section, okay. And let us say that is capital V. Now, what is going to happen? What is the base state? Base state, the one which you are talking about is the one where the interface is flat, 
and then we give perturbations and then we are asking whether it is stable or not stable, okay. So the base state is going to be one which is having a flat interface, I am continuously pumping one liquid. So what is going to happen, this interface is going to keep on moving. So actually your base state is not a steady state, you understand, because the interface keeps moving. So in order to make the base state a steady state, one way to do is just analyze the problem in a moving reference frame. That is, if the base velocity is v, you move along with the liquid. So at every point of time, it looks like you are at a steady state, okay. So um, the interface keeps moving at a fixed velocity, okay. And if we analyze this frame, Okay. And so the moving reference frame will be having a velocity v, okay, capital V again. And if you are moving along with this, it will look like the interface is stationary. Okay. So, you know, for all practical purposes, this is really a multiphase flow problem because you have a solid bed, interstices, and everything, and then you have two liquids, right. And so, this must be the grand climax of this course, having so many uh, different phases. Now, we have not done uh, flow through porous media so far, but you always used uh, Navier Stokes equations. Hmm? And um, one of the things which we want to do is in uh, flow through porous media, uh, that basically that is what it is, right? Flow through porous media. This is characterized by what kind of a relationship for momentum balance, the one which relates pressure gradient to the velocity field. Can we use Navier-Stokes equations? Of course, you can use Navier-Stokes equations, but what is typically used in uh, porous media to describe pressure drop and velocity? The, the, the Ergen equation or a simplified form of uh, the Ergen equation would be the Darcy's law, okay. So basically what we are going to do is we are going to use Darcy's law which relates velocity to the gradient of pressure, okay. Now, if you really see many people do a lot of extensive research in porous media, okay. And uh, depending upon the level of detail you are interested in, you will uh, decide to, you know, go into detail and start doing the analysis of the problem. So one approach, one approach is extremely detailed is you take a porous media and the porous media is basically going to be an interconnected channel, right? The, basically the liquid is going to flow through some interconnected network of channels or pores. And if you are interested, you can really go down to finding out what this geometry of the channels is, it could be a random network and then in each of these channels you should write down the equation of continuity, equation of motion and then you solve for the velocities and then you actually predict the behavior of the flow. That is one approach. Clearly what that, that means is you need to possibly model the entire thing as a section of channels and uh, find out the velocity field. The advantage is uh, or the, one of the simplifications is that since the size of the channels is very, very small, your Reynolds numbers are going to be very low and for all practical purposes you can use the creeping flow limit, low Reynolds number limit. You can neglect all the inertial terms and you only have the pressure term and the viscous term, okay. So that is one approach where you go to the detail level. So. Um, 
we, we can go down to the level of the network of pores or channels and solve the Navier-Stokes equations with equation of continuity and get the flow pro, uh, field. But this is of course extremely intensive, right? This is, shall we just say, painful. Uh, Who is going to sit down and go through every pore and then do this network, right? Because most of the time what we are interested in is some kind of an average information, right? We want to find out. So just like you do uh, use the continuum hypothesis and uh, talk in terms of a velocity at a particular point, which means it is the velocity of a collection of molecules in the neighborhood of that point, right? So we are going to use something like a, a similar averaging approach to actually discuss, uh, describe and that is what Darcy's law does. Darcy's law when he is talking about u being related to gradient of p, okay, being linearly related to gradient of p because you are in the creeping flow limit, okay, um, he is talking about an average velocity. And uh, so what is this averaging? This averaging is being done over length scales which are larger than the length of the pore but not so large that the variations of velocity from one point to another in the system are lost. You understand? So that is you have to do an averaging of velocity over a bunch of pores so that you get some average information of the velocity. But if you take the averaging over the entire length, then you will get a uniform value across the entire length. But that, then you are losing the information of changes along the length of the channel. Okay, so you want that information to be present. So you have to choose this averaging um, domain, averaging size, the length scale over which you are averaging properly. And that is basically what we do in continuum also. In continuum hypothesis, when I am talking, writing down the equation of continuity, equation of momentum, you choose your length scales or your volumes so that it is not too big and it is not too small. It should be sufficient to have enough number of molecules so that you can actually do a, get a good average. When it is too big, then you won't get the velocity variation. Okay, so basically that's what we are doing. So we are we're not going to be using this approach because this is just not worth it. Because you're going to get information which is possibly not useful. Who cares what the velocity is in each pore? You only want to know if the interface is going to be deflected or not. So I don't want to waste my time trying to get this detailed velocity field information. Okay, unless uh, your grade in the course depends on this, then you have to. Okay, so what we do is. And, and your grade doesn't depend on that, so you can be sure. Okay, so we average over a length scale which is larger than the pore size okay but lower than the size of the system so it might contain several pore sizes Okay, so basically your average velocity is the velocity average over these four or five pore sizes. Okay, and idea is if you take more, it's not going to change the average value. So this uh, average information is over uh, several 
four uh, diameters, but if it is too many, if it is, if the length scale is too large, then the velocity variations will not be captured. So, for example, if you have a porous bed, and that is it, I am not going to draw more of this. But if you if are interested in what is the actual velocity field in each of these pores, that is my first approach. And but if you, that is this approach that I am talking about. But I am going to say, look, I am going to take this length scale, take several pores into account, and I am interested in the average velocity here. Okay, then I can get the average velocity at this po this portion. I look at this region here, and get the average velocity. This way, if there's a variation in velocity from one section to another, I'm able to capture it. If I take the entire thing and then do the averaging, I will get one velocity everywhere, and then the variation in the velocity I'm losing. Okay, so I want to get the variation in the velocity in this domain. So, I am going to have to keep it sufficiently uh, small to do that. But I do not want to go too small because then I do not have enough pores to do the averaging. Okay? So, it is a kind of a tricky business and that is basically what the theory is okay, for Darcy's law. Okay? And um, so, that is, yeah, if the entire cross section is used, then we get one average and lose information on the local variations. So, what I like to do is uh, I am not going to derive Darcy's law, but I am going to give you some feel for how Darcy's law can possibly come from uh, the Navier-Stokes equation. Well, once you understand that, then it is, uh, we can proceed further. Okay? There are some small subtleties which I like to mention. So, uh, let me say an uh, uh, approximate derivation. Darcy's law, not a derivation actually. Okay. Now, what is the Navier-Stokes equation that you write? du by dt plus u dot del u equals minus the gradient of p plus mu del squared u plus rho g. That is your Navier-Stokes equation. And clearly, inside every pore, the Navier-Stokes equation is valid. Okay? But remember, we are talking about porous bed, where the size of the pores is of the order of some microns. So, the Reynolds numbers are going to be very, very low. Okay? So, essentially what that means is, if the Reynolds numbers are very, very low, you have the initial terms are very, very negligible. So, this is basically 0 for all practical purposes and that is your creeping flow limit. Okay, so since pore sizes of the order of microns, the left hand side which has initial terms is set to 0. 
Okay, low Reynolds number. I Reynolds number tends to 0. And then what am I left with? I am left with this equation 0 equals minus gradient of p plus mu del squared u plus rho g. Okay. So now let us forget the fact that I mean actually you have three velocity components. So just let us just look at one velocity uh, component. So for each velocity component, it is going to be of the form for each component. Your equation is going to be of the form, um, let us say dp by dx, if I bring it to the other side, equals mu del squared u, this is of course the velocity vector, plus rho gx. Now del squared u, and like you have seen, in the case of the laminar flow, for example, the flow is going to be laminar inside these pores. Okay, del square u is therefore going to be given by some kind of one-dimensional velocity field, where you have something like a parabolic velocity profile. So, supposing you have a second derivative here, which is what you will get in the y direction, minus dp by dx is mu d square u by dy square. You have a very thin channel and you have a second derivative inside this channel. One way for you to do this is to approximate the second derivative by a simple finite difference scheme. Okay. You can, uh, so this is flow through a small channel which is very thin, just use a second derivative approximation numerically. What would you get? U i minus or rather u i minus 1 minus 2 u i plus u i plus 1. Okay, so that is what I am going to do. I am going to basically uh, use the fact. So, this is the y direction and this is the x direction. d square u by dy square, and rather than take you know 10 grids and 20 grids, let us just take 3 grids, 2 will coincide with the wall, 1 will be at the center. Okay, so this is u1, u2 and let us say u3. Clearly, what is d square u by d y square evaluated at y equal to the center? It is u1 minus 2 u2 plus u3 divided by delta y square. Okay, but delta y is this distance. Yeah? Now, because of the no-slip boundary condition, u1 and u3 are going to be 0. Okay? So, basically what I have done is, I am, this is uh, a 3 point finite difference, that is what I am using. And from the no-slip boundary condition, these guys become 0. So, u1 equals u3 equals 0 from no slip. And now, if I were to basically uh, use this information over there, what am I going to get? dp by dy minus rho gx, sorry, dp by dx, dp by dx, yeah, minus rho gx equals mu times this thing here mu times minus 2 divided by delta y whole square times u2. Okay. Now, basically this is of course a constant and uh, what I could do is, I can bring in this gravitational field also as a gradient. I can write this as d by dx of rho gx x. Okay, and I can combine these two guys. And I can get d by dx of some modified pressure, the thing that I was describing the other day, equals minus of u. 
And remember that is basically what I wrote in Darcy's law is the pressure gradient is uh, the linearly related to the velocity and that is basically what I am showing you here that this is the pressure gradient which includes the effect of the gravitational field is linearly related to the velocity. Okay. Of course, this is not a formal proof, but that is basically the idea that you have. And uh, Darcy's law was actually found by uh, experiments actually and then uh, you know people started wondering about how to go about getting this. So, basically what I am saying is I am going to write this as d by dx of p minus rho gx x equals minus 2 minus mu times 2 by delta y whole square times u2, u2 is some velocity inside the bore which is let us say averaged out. Okay. And uh, this tells me this is uh, d by dx of some kind of a modified pressure equals minus mu by k u. And this is for one component which I have written. You can write the same thing for different components of velocities in the y and z direction okay? and you will get the same thing. So, that is basically to try to tell you how Darcy's law comes up. Okay? A P m is including the actual pressure and the gravitational field, P is only the pressure. I want you to keep this in mind because tomorrow when I am applying the normal stress boundary condition, I am going to be saying things about uh, the pressures are equal. Okay? Then I have to use the actual pressure not the modified pressure. So, that is uh, an important subtle point which you have to keep in mind. So, this is basically the form of Darcy's law. Now, I have suddenly put in a k here and the delta y disappeared. Okay. This k is actually a property of the bed because depending upon whether you are. So, the clearly the pressure drop and the velocity relationship is going to be decided by number 1 the property of the fluid and it turns out that the property of the fluid which is important is viscosity okay, because that is the one which gives you the drag force along the walls. So, that is being retained and this approximate thing where this delta 2 by delta y square disappeared, I just put in a k here, there is something like a proportionality constant that is going to be decided by the material of the bed, is it sand, is it clay, is it, uh, is it glass spheres. So, depending upon that you will actually get a different proportionality constant. So, this k uh, is obtained experimentally and this the permeability of the bed. Okay. So, you will say that, uh, so if the bed is very permeable that means the void spacing is very, very large, the liquid can flow through very easily. If the uh, spore space is very, very low then the permeability is low, uh, low things like that. Okay. So, that is the proportionality constant which is a property of the bed. Now, that is a simple, uh, so one thing which I want to, you to be clear about is that the viscosity plays an important role. Okay. This, this is a viscous flow, viscosity is important. However, the fact that um, velocity is linearly related to the pressure okay, is symbolic. So, for example, many people like to write this as, uh, I can write the same relationship as u equals minus k by mu times gradient of p m and I am trying to follow Gary Lee's notation as far as possible okay. and this can be written as gradient of phi and I am using plus here instead of minus. That is, this is remember some kind of a scalar, the gradient of that is basically my velocity. Okay. I mean, I am k divided by mu multiplied by p m is my phi. Okay. So, this phi is, I am using the symbol phi because phi is normally used to denote potential. Okay. So, if you go back to your fluid mechanics, 
what kind of flows are actually uh, going to be given uh, by a relationship of this kind where the velocity is a gradient of a potential. Of course, you have these things called potential flows and if you remember something you must have studied somewhere that potential flows essentially arise when you have an inviscid when viscosity is not there. Okay. Normally, you associate potential flows with inviscid flows. So, the point I am trying to make here is this is something like a potential flow because I can view the velocity as the gradient of a potential, but actually I am not saying it is inviscid. I am saying viscosity is present. So, I mean I am trying to incorporate in Darcy's law formulation, we are including the effect of the viscosity. Okay, because that is how I have u equals minus k by mu gradient of pm, but it is also similar in some sense to a potential flow and potential flow is normally associated with inviscid. Okay. And inviscid, uh, I, I am not going to say inviscid when I am doing my viscous fingering problem because if I say inviscid, viscosity is 0, viscosity is 0, then I mean I will not be able to say you know when there is going to be viscous, when there is going to be fingering and when there is going to be no fingering. So, if I put viscosity equal to 0, I want to keep the effect of the viscosity. Okay. So, I want to, I am going to use the fact that it is something like a potential flow, but I am going to keep the effect of viscosity. So, that is something like a very subtle point which I wanted to emphasize here. So, there are many people who uh, mistake potential flows to be flows which are inviscid. I am saying here we have a potential flow which is not inviscid, which is actually viscous. In fact, there are people who are actually uh, distinguishing between potential flows which have uh, the effect of viscosity included. Okay. So, for example, so to summarize what I am saying is Darcy's law has the effect of viscosity okay it can be viewed as a potential flow but this is an example of a potential flow which is viscous. Normally, potential flows are synonymous to inviscid flows. I mean that is some kind of a misconception which people have a potential flow that means inviscid. It is not necessarily true. If it is a potential flow you can also have viscosity effect okay? and uh, that is something which is uh, extremely important which I want you to understand. Um, so, now life is a little bit more simple in the sense to just give you the outline of what we are going to do. We have you know two equations have to be satisfied. One is the continuity equation and the uh, momentum equation, right? So we uh, have to satisfy divergence of u equal to zero. That's the continuity equation and the momentum equation, which is my Darcy's law. Okay, my Darcy's law, which is gradient of pm equals minus u. I mean, you can put this k and uh, mu and all that. Uh, where does that come? Multiplied by mu divided by k. That's my Darcy's law in the general form, in the vectorial form. Okay. So. The simple thing to do is and this is the approach we are going to use tomorrow. I am going to take the divergence of this equation. If I take the divergence of this equation, I get divergence of u here. 
I get divergence of del p which is del square p okay equal to 0. So, basically what I am saying is this flow field satisfies del square p m equal to 0 and that is a Laplacian equation which you know everybody knows how to solve because they have done this course in calculus uh, and you know can do by separation of variables whatever blah blah okay. So, this is a linear equation which you can solve and that is one of the advantages of this potential flow the relationship is linear. Then you uh, go back you solve for the pressure field once you know the pressure field you can go get the velocity field you can put those boundary conditions. The other important point is although this has the effect of viscosity in it okay what is the um, order of the equation for the velocity for uh, in the navier stokes equation the regular navier stokes equation is second order okay but when i'm going to not use the navier stokes equation but i'm going to use darcy's law I have the same problem in the sense that I do not have my second order term for my velocity, my second derivative term d square u by dx square. Normally, I would have d square u by dy square, in which case I need to have two boundary conditions. I have only the first derivative term in the equation of continuity, okay. So, again, I have the same problem as that of inviscid flow. In visit flow, what do you do? You say, look, my equation which was second order, the momentum equation has now become first order. So, one boundary condition I have to let go of and the boundary condition which we let go of is the tangential stress boundary condition. So, here again, you can see mathematically, it is a first order equation in velocity, okay. It is not a second order equation in velocity. So, you have to let go of one boundary condition. Again, the boundary condition which you are going to let go of is the tangential stress boundary condition. So, although you have viscosity present in it, you are going to let go of the tangential stress boundary condition because you will not be able to use the there is an extra boundary condition which you cannot solve for the constant because the order of the equation is actually reduced, okay. So, that is again something which you have to keep in mind tomorrow when we are doing it. Although, ideally, you need the Navis, the uh, tangential stress boundary condition, the normal stress boundary condition we are going to let go of the tangential stress boundary condition because mathematically uh, we do not require one boundary condition. The uh, normal stress boundary condition is important because the pressure difference is the one which is actually driving the flow and I want to keep that guy. If I let go of that nothing is going to happen, okay. So, that is uh, some small points here. We will do the actual derivation and get the condition for stability and try to understand things tomorrow. Thanks.